We've all been there. You're trying to explain complex information during consultations, but there's just not enough time. We know that with more time, a better explanation could lead to improved compliance or even patients adopting premium treatment options. Captivate Share is a new patient education app designed for all ophthalmologists and optometrists. It contains hundreds of beautiful animations about treatments, eye conditions and vision correction options. Now you just need to enter the patient's mobile number or email and share one or more beautiful animations in seconds. Patients love it because it's instant. They can watch the videos on any device, leading to much greater understanding, which leads to happier patients and a better chance of them taking you up on your treatment suggestions. Captivate Share doesn't stop there. Post-treatment, you can even perform securely encrypted one-to-one -one video consultations right through the app and patients don't need to download anything. Unlike other telemedicine tools, Captivate Share seamlessly integrates patient education into telemedicine to ensure your patients truly understand your advice. And if you happen to want to share your expertise with the world, you can even improve your engagement with potential patients or referrers through social media by adding stunning animations and messages to your social media posts. Learn more about this amazingly affordable, easy to use app that will wow your patients and save you time. After all, happy patients equals a happy practice. Download the app now from the App Store or the Google Play Store or learn more at optimed.co.uk forward slash share app. It's a pleasure to introduce you from a wet and uh, windy UK um, to the first ever YO uh, seminar today. Uh, um, it's a real privilege to be part of it. I'm the YO chair. My name's Anka Brewer. And we have a very exciting session in store for you for the next two hours. Um, it's split into four sections. So we're going to start off with uh, Iman, who's going to be our moderator for the next session, introducing Florian Kretz, who's a highly skilled surgeon who's going to talk to us about multifocal uh, lenses and the science behind it. And then we've got Dr. Alice Stewart, who's a good colleague of mine, who's going to present his research paper. And then after that, we've got uh, uh, Michael talking about uh, research uh, and how to break down papers. And then finally, we've got Tanya talking about uh, how to secure a dream fellowship, which should be very interesting to all of you, I'm sure. Just to let you know, the YO group will be meeting every month and we're really keen to have more YO members uh, join us. Uh, and I really want you all to spread the word. I'm also quite keen on uh, trying to encourage more uh, people to join and help us. Um, so just as a summary, a YO uh, in our definition would be anyone who's post uh, completion of ophthalmic training for the first 10 years. It's welcome to everyone to join or to uh, uh, to watch, but uh, anyone who wants to get take this further and join us and help us, uh, you're welcome to contact us through the website or through Facebook or through us directly by email. Um, I won't keep you any longer, so I'll pass you on to Iman, who will moderate the first session uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Florian Kretz. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Angkor. Hi, hi everyone. I would like to thank everyone who's joining us today as well as our speakers. I am Dr. Iman Tarib from Morocco and I am a member of the Young Ophthalmologist Committee, Committee of Gerzo. Gerzo is the Global Education and Research Society of Ophthalmology. As our chair, Dr. Ankur, just mentioned, we'll be having monthly meetings, so stick around to learn more about next months. Um, thank you again for our speakers and the audience who's joining us today. To get this party started, it is my absolute pleasure to present our first speaker, Dr. Florian Kretz from Germany. Dr. Kretz is a world-renowned cataract and refractive surgeon who specializes in premium cataract surgery. He'll be talking to us today about the multifocal intraocular lenses and the science behind them. Dr. Kretz? Thank you very much, Iman, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure for me being here. Uh, I believe Gizzo is really a step ahead. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of cataract surgery and especially presbyopia correction, um, as there is a lot of like confusion around naming, labeling, and all that stuff. Here are my financial disclosures. I guess all of us know those patients that have their demands, but actually we as ophthalmologists have even more demands. We want ideal IOLs. For, um, the best would be one model that suits everyone. 
no dysphotopsia, no loss of contrast sensitivity, non-compromises uh, in distance vision, good intermediate, good near vision and all that. And there is a German saying, it's good called the Eierlegende Wollmilchsau, uh, but actually for ophthalmology, that is not possible. We have a huge variety of different IOLs available. And the key here really is to match those IOLs to each patient. And each and every patient is quite different. We have patients that are very near focused, patients that want more like a broad overall vision, um, don't like this photopsias, and we have patients that are purely distance focused and they don't mind wearing reading glasses. Some of them actually do like them. And then there is the demands that they have for their daily routines, reading distances, light conditions that they work in, and also the individual focus for their hobbies. So very important is the individualizing process of it. We have to look closer at the patient and the patient's demands, the workforce, the hobbies, and also the acceptance for side effects like this photopsias. We already spoke about that we need to take a closer look at the demands of the patient, what they really need, what light circumstances they have, what different distances they are using to match basically what we can offer them to their demands. And then comes the big part, what we're actually talking about. It's the different choices available. To be honest, there is even more available on the market right now that is on that slide, but we have the trifocals for distance, intermediate and near. We have the so-called EDOFs, which is more a brand name than actually describing the technology. We still have bifocal IOLs that offer us a very good outcome for patients if they only need two focuses. And we have the variety of combining different optical principles for presbyopia correction. And still, there is monofocal IOLs that you can use, especially in the way of working with the spherical apparition to create depths of focus. So if we look at those optical principles, the basic principle that we do have and that is long for a long time is working with the spherical apparition. If the spherical apparition is correct, we get a really distinct focal point. While if we don't correct it, you can see we have several focal points behind each other. And that creates depths of focus with a little bit less contrast. And it doesn't really matter if you have negative or positive spherical aberration. That's just the way where the light waves go. But both of them create depths of focus. It's just more the target refraction that makes the difference for those patients. So you can see here some charts now simulating that and it's the same principle that is used with presbyon for example that this spherical apparition can really give you a good depth of focus for your patient so if you look at the cornea beforehand you might not even need a so-called edof iol to give them intermediate vision and that has been proven with monovision and micro monovision in many publications in the past making it even more important to look at the measurements of your patients but then we have patients that, you know, everybody of us wants to promise them something and stick to the promise. So there are patients that don't want any dysphotopsias, but they want true intermediate vision. And in those cases, a diffractive IOL is not the right choice because those rings always create halo. We can work with monofocal monovision, or we can work with rotational asymmetric EDOF IOLs, or even mix and match. And I'm going to show to you what it means to have a rotational asymmetric IOL or a mix and match approach in the case of this photopsia. Those are the median values of a halo and glare simulator after implantation of those lenses. So the patient really adjusts what he sees. And to be honest, that is the same outcome that you get with monofocal IOLs. But what benefit does, do those patients really have? You can see here the focus curves of an MF20 rotational asymmetric uh, lens with a plus two diopter and yet, and an IC8, a pinhole lens, and the binocular curve. And you can really see those patients have a good defocus from around plus one to around minus 1.5, meaning they have really good distance vision and they still have very good intermediate and some functional near. If we compare that to a rotational asymmetric lens with plus 1.5, you can also see the range is closer around the target. So they start with around plus 0 0.5 with functional vision, and it also goes down to minus 1.5, which is a really good option. And you don't have any disadvantages compared to a monofocal IOL. Just to say those are aberration neutral optics. 
So it's comparable with the dysphotopsia to a monofocal. They all have good distance vision. A pinhole IOL you can also use for higher apparated corneas or even after RKs. And personally, I switched my standard patients to rotational asymmetric low ad lenses like the MF15 or the Aconex Vario. Still, those patients need to be counseled, they need reading glasses. Just one more trick. If they have spherical apparition in the cornea and those optics are apparition neutral, that also means that the intermediate vision is elongated. So you can combine those technologies. Now we come to this so-called EDOF. EDOF just means enhancing depth of focus. So basically every multifocal, trifocal, every lens that corrects for presbyopia, even a spherical eye oil that induces spherical apparition is kind of an EDOF lens. That's why this name or brand has to be used very carefully because it doesn't describe the true physics of the eye oil. It just means there's a range of focuses created with any way. If we look at diffractive optics, and every one of you has seen those rings, those rings it's also called a step. And basically it means it's a sharp structure on the lens that bends the light from one focal point onto two focal points. What means if you have a trifocal, you just need two different steps on the lens to create three foci. A quadrifocal would be three steps. And you can see here on uh, the measurement on the optical bench, the distinct focal points, but you can also see this elongated focus, the so-called EDOF, which just means in this situation, there's other apparations used to elongate the focus. You can see here the slides from Damien Gatinel for the trifocal IOLs. And this technology isn't all of them. It doesn't matter which manufacturer. So it's just two different steps combined on one optic. Both steps create the distance focus. And each one, depending on the step height and the step width, creates a different near focus. And by using half of the ad power, you basically create a better use of light. Because the light is not just bent in two foci, there's higher order focuses that are used as well. And they are going to double of the ad power, four times of the ad power. So here you can basically use the stray light from intermediate to enhance your distance vision. And in total, you have less lost light. And if you put a trifocal and bifocal lens on the optical bench, you can see they all have, compared to a monofocal, very good distance vision. But a true intermediate image is only possible with this trifocal technology. And still, you see the quality is not that high, but for our brain, it's enough to sufficiently work with it during our daily return. Another thing we can work with is chromatic aberration. The effect of chromatic aberration is not that strong, but by correcting it, you have a better contrast vision. And you can see that especially with different pupil sizes, because usually in a smaller pupil, it's never an issue if you have spheric aberration or chromatic aberration. But in a larger pupil, it can make a difference and it can make the image sharper with reducing depths of focus. So you can hear, see here some slides with like the average predicted visual acuity of 2020 with having chromatic aberration, spherical aberration. If you take the chromatic aberration problem out, you already increase it by one line. If you correct the spherical aberration, you can even increase it by nearly two lines. And if you correct both, you actually can get an increase of around 40%. Keep in mind, if you correct it all, you lose depths of focus. So you, have your, you, so you get a patient with a perfect outcome in one focal point, but a really small degree of depth of focus. So they can be quite unhappy too, even they have brain vision. Then there are so those called near focus patients. Personally, in those cases, for me, they are binocular trifocal lenses. And if you look, they have different light distributions, they have different ad powers, they have different filters, meaning you need to match it to the distances your patients want to see, to their daily habits, depending on the pupil size. If they're driving at night, you need apodization. Do you want a lens in the periphery is only bifocal? And also those filters are important. Personally, I use a yellow tinted IOL when patients are a lot on the water, just to give them a better feeling and have less problems with the reflection on the surface. But if somebody's inside, 
a lot working on the computer and stuff, I prefer giving them a clear optic so they can use more of the light. You can see a comparison, those are three different trifocal IOLs, two from Physio, one from Alcon, and you can see the performance is pretty much equal, even there's a little difference in between that is never significant. And only in the defocus curve here you can see that the intermediate add power shifts the intermediate focus a little bit and that is also something you need to keep in mind try to find the right lens for the right patient if they have short arms and they're smaller or highly myopic they're happy to read closer by if they're more computer working or they're taller have longer arms were maybe hyperopic before give them something with like a better intermediate in a closer range and they don't need to have that really near distance for reading, they're happy with 10 centimeters more too. Also, those IOLs all have shown their long-term stabilities and so don't really need to worry which manufacturer you choose. The other thing is, for me, those EDOF lenses. And I personally prefer to use them by the optical technology that's used. Here, the so-called diffractive EDOFs. And they give you spectacle independence around 50 to 60 centimeters. The main groups here is the Tecna Symphony and the Artillara at the moment, because the others are not working with a diffractive principle. And you can see here, they have very good distance vision and they have good intermediate and they have a lack of near. But for patients that are happy with that, and they're happy to have like less dysphotopsia, that is a really good option. And you can see that the dysphotopsia, especially of the Lara, is less than of the Lisa as a trifocal, but it's still more than a monofocal or a rotational asymmetric IOL. But definitely less than before the cataract surgery. The big benefits here are it's a smooth visual transition from 60 centimeter to distance and reduce dysphotopsia. And why? Usually you all could answer that after this uh, session because you know they're diffractive, they're not correcting the spherical aberration. The symphony is correcting the chromatic aberration, but with keeping the spherical aberration of the cornea and having those smaller steps from distance to intermediate, it becomes a more smoother vision because you're using the stray light and the spherical aberration of the cornea to basically elongate your focuses by placing many, many focal points between the distance and intermediate range. The other things you can do is you can work with so-called mix and match. Combining two optics, one for distance, intermediate, and near, and one rather for distance and intermediate. And personally, I do like working here with size, and you can see that in the chart, like before the diffractive eat of Artillara, distance, intermediate, and near, and you can see I made it oval because it's an aberration neutral IOL, so it elongates the focuses around the focal point. For binocular amyotropia, very good for distance focused patients. Also a good option for micro mono vision to offer true spectacle independency. But you can combine it with a trifocal and the LISA tree corrects for the spherical aberration. That's why you have such distinct focal points in those distances. But looking at it binocularly, you can see they're really overlapping and patients have a very good vision from distance to near. And you can see that in visual acuity measurements like here in set distances, where binocularly there's basically becoming a curve. And if you look at that straight curve, you also find it in the defocus curve analysis where we just place quarter of the diopter in front of the eye for each step and recall to visual acuity. But if we look at the dysphotopsia level, those patients do have more dysphotopsia than binocular diaphragtive EDOF but less than binocular trifocal and more than when you work with monofocals or rotational asymmetric EDOFs. So my personal take home message is if you want to do overall vision, always think about a mix and match approach. You just need to explain to the patient that the vision can be different between the right and the left eye, but they're very happy because they have binocular distance vision. If you want to go for less dysphotopsia, you can use a comfort IOL binocular. You can use a mix and match between an MF20 and an IC8. You can also work with other monofocal ESOFs like the ones that are coming out from Bausch & Lomb now, the LookSmart or the ME4 from Senton. They all work very well. And it's a true way to give patients less dysphotopsia 
and a good visual acuity at least onto intermediate. Also keep in mind in those cases, look at the cornea, look at the spherical aberration. You can use that spherical aberration to increase the focus on top of it. If a patient is really distance focused and want true intermediate and you want to keep your promise, a diffractive either of IOL is a very good option, but you need to counsel him for the dysphotopsia. And near focus, in my experience, I like working with trifocals. It works very well, especially if they have binocular near tasks. And those patients are very happy. But the counseling is important so they know what to expect, especially regarding dysphotopsias. So thank you very much for your kind attention and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Kretz, for this great presentation. Definitely lots of pearls for the young ophthalmologists with us today. Uh, on that last no note, there are many young ophthalmologists who are used to uh, exclusively to monofocals and would like to get started with the multifocal IULs and get their patients all the benefits from those. But there is a, uh, a lot of fear around basically the most important factor, which is patient satisfaction. If you have any advice for the starting young ophthalmologist using this technology regarding that, what would that be, please? Well, the thing is you need to limit the expectation of your patient. Um, always under promise and always over deliver. And look at what you what you want to implant. Look at the technology behind it. Does that technology fit your patient's needs? All patients want perfect vision. But they have different demands. For somebody, perfect vision just means that uh, in the morning he sees the timer beside his bed. And he has never seen it because he was myopic before. So with keeping those little tricks in mind and starting simple, um, you actually don't have problems and you can always over deliver. But make sure you look at all the values and you look at all the optical properties of the patient's eye and also of the lens that you want to implant. It's much simpler than most people really think. Yeah, but definitely starts with understanding the, the science behind it uh, in the same way you explained it to all of us today. So I'm going to take some questions from the audience here. And the first one is, in refractive lens exchange cases, what is the lowest best corrected visual acuity uh, when you can still implant a trifocal lens? Well, you mean if one eye is amblyopic? Uh, personally, um, uh, maybe... It's a difficult question to answer. If one eye has 20-20 and the other one has 20, uh, uh, you know, has 20, 32 or less, I would, in that situation, I would go for a trifocal. To be honest, uh, if a patient is amblyopic and sees less than 0 0.5 decimal in the amblyopic eye, uh, I put a monofocal or monofocal toric in the distance dominant eye and a trifocal sulcoflex on top of it, because I can reverse the surgery and take the trifocal optic out in case anything else happens. In the fellow eye, I only correct with a monofocal. And those patients, if they're counseled right, they're also very happy and they can work very well with only having one trifocal in the eye. Uh, and personally, I think it works much better. 0 0.5 really is like my deadline. Underneath there, I don't put any uh, multifocal lenses in. All right, thank you. Um, next question is, what are your views on extended monovision lenses and their role in refractive practice? Oh, I like extended monovision lenses, but the thing is an extended monovision lens is only an extended monovision lens if it is matched to the higher order apparitions of the eye. And uh, that's, I think, the biggest issue right now. And if you look at all the study data, they are compared in, uh, in normal groups in practice, they don't really perform much, much better than a regular monofocal. And actually, if you look at old data, they can perform even worse than a spherical lens. Why? Because all those lenses work with apparitions. And if you don't match the apparitions to the lens, they are not going to work that well. So I believe that they are a great chance for us, especially to reduce dysphotopsias. But none of them is capable with an amotropia approach binocularly to really cope for vision for distance to near. And you need to match them. Otherwise, you know, it's just an expensive lens that you put in and the patient doesn't benefit of it because his or her spherical aberration, coma, does not really match the IOL. Yes, which is always something to take into consideration. Very important. Um, someone is asking, can you explain why some patients with monofocal IOL end up with good distance and near vision? Well, I explained that before. They have spherical aberration. 
you know, even the mean spherical aberration is somewhere between uh, plus 0 0.2 to plus uh, 3, 0 0.3. There are still some patients that have plus 0 0.5, and then basically putting a monofocal in is doing presbyon to them just without the monovision. That's why they can read newspaper print. The other thing is, if a patient had the potential to see 2010, and there are some patients out there, and they have a little bit of spherical aberration, for sure with 2010 for distance, uh, they can even read uh, 2032, just because they have the possibility, or the retina has the possibility to have that resolution. Yeah, so it's like they create different foci with the monofocal lens, only based on the, uh, their vision. So the next question is, um, for a new refractive surgeon, what patient and lenses would be ideal to start with? Well, the easiest one is monofocal EDOFs because you can't do anything wrong and you can't really, under, as you, nothing is happening even if you match it wrong. It is still work as a monofocal, it's just the patient does not get the depth of focus with it. Uh, on the other hand, if you work with a trifocal because you know how to read uh, your topography, you have a good biometry, nothing goes wrong either. You just have to explain the patient to this photopsia. And it works, and you need to show it to the patient, you know, just print it out from the internet and tell them, here, that's typical dysphotopsia, or download the Zeiss software, I think it's available for free, and let the patient adjust his dysphotopsia beforehand, uh, and then show him the chart, because many patients have dysphotopsia already, and if you select them right, and you use those myopic astigmatic patients that have a lot of dysphotopsia, and you place a trifocal in them, and they can read and see in distance, they are super happy, and they won't complain. Just don't take somebody that has a perfect vision and it's just a little bit presbyopic. That always goes wrong in the beginning. Yes, and would you say uh, an older or a younger population is a good uh, population to start with? Oh, the best population to start with is the one that has a bad vision beforehand. So if they, like I said before, if they have astigmatism, maybe are used to a little bit larger pupil and stuff like this, Have then you know, they know optical phenomena, so they won't have problems with a trifocal and actually it becomes even more distinct. Uh, a patient that lived with like a cataract for a long time, um, they are always happy to, because they're used to the bad vision and the, the uh, light disturbances. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts about piggyback multifocal lenses? Uh, well, like, like I the said trifocal, before. ICL, et cetera. On, there is a bifocal ICL from an English manufacturer, but it's a fake lens, so mm -hmm. it's not a piggyback lens, uh, which works well, but it's diffractive, so they do have a little bit of dysphotopsia. Mm -hmm. You could probably use it as a piggyback lens as well, but for that, Rayner has a trifocal sarcoflex, which works very well, and I use it in patients that have one amblyopic eye. Um, because I know if anything happens later, I can take it out, and they still have a good monofocal lens in the back. So I'm actually a big friend of it, but I don't think it's necessary for any case, because there is always a little risk of iris shaving and that stuff in those cases. So personally, it's something that I only use in a few cases. Okay, next question is, um, do you think that trifocal lenses are good for aviation airplane pilots? Aviation so airplane. A very in particular, a set of patients. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's a hobby uh, pilot, they are perfect. But if it's a commercial pilot, they are forbidden. Diffractic uh, technology or any CE or FDA licensing of um, intraocular implants for pres uh, via presbyopia correction are not allowed. What is allowed are so-called monofocal EDOFs or any lenses that are labeled as monofocals. And with them, you can really help those airplane pilots. Uh, otherwise, they would be completely grounded. So that's not the perfect option. Better to do in those cases a monovision approach. All right. Well, I think uh, I think those were all the questions that we had. Uh, thank you again for a great talk. We might just have an extra couple of questions from our uh, guest residents. This is a particular format that we're trying to adopt in our webinars where we get residents uh, to ask live questions. So if we can just get Dr. Atanas and Dr. Anesu on, please. Okay, so I had a question um, that I wanted to ask you, Dr. Kretz, about uh, the software that you uh, mentioned. 
uh, about the uh, post-operative results and the um, uh, diffractive for diffractive lenses. So uh, you said it's available for free. Can you elaborate more on that? Oh, it's a software that's programmed by a little software place close by here, and Zeiss has licensed it. And it's just a software where you in adjust what you see. It's basically giving you the possibility to make an image of your vision um, by nighttime driving. There are several available. So you just have to Google it, and you will find a few that are cheap to buy or that you can download. Otherwise, ask your Zeiss rep uh, representative. They have that software as well and can just give it to you. Mm -hmm. um, it's nothing special. It's just an image. If you're a good painter, you can paint your halos and glare yourself as well. So you can yes, always ask your always, patient to draw it. Yeah, it's always good okay. to uh, so, have visual observations. And you use it routinely in your practice? We use it routinely for every cataract patient, pre and post-op, because uh, often patients say they have more dysphotopsia. The benefit of the software is it gives you a grading of percentage. Iman has actually written papers for that. And um, the benefit is a patient comes to you after surgery and says, oh, I have so much more halo. And then you show them the pre and the post-op picture, and actually they have less this photopsy or post-op. They just have a better vision. So they experience their halo more than the glare they had beforehand. So for me, it's also good legal advice to document the pre and the post-op, especially in refractive lens exchange cases. Sorry, Athanas, I just wanted to add that this particular, uh, this particular uh, software allowed us to also have the patients adjust the levels of their dysphotopsia and the types as well. So I think this is where uh, the, the fact that it is interactive made the patients feel like they were part of making the decision about their surgery, as well as assessing their outcomes. Dr. Kretz, thank you so much for a very informative talk. As um, Iman mentioned, as a newly qualified ophthalmologist, I only have experience with monofocal. IOL. So I'd love to start getting into offering my patients better in the form of trifocals and multifocals. Um, what I'd like to know is how do you deal with a patient who's dissatisfied following putting in a monofocal, um, sorry, multifocal or trifocal? The, the question is why is the patient dissatisfied? Does he not okay. have enough visual function? Does he have dysphotopsia? Um, maybe he just has dry eye like a monofocal patient does too. Uh, it's very important to look closer. What is the the real dissatisfaction the patient has? Okay. All right. So you can give me an example. What problem your patient might have? What he's bothered with? Um, as I mentioned, I, I haven't used any multifocals as yet. But I think as a junior ophthalmologist, you're almost discouraged from using them because you're told that there are so many issues with the spherical aberrations and the dysphotopsias and the glare and the halos. So you develop, or at least for me personally, you develop almost an apprehension towards them. Yeah, I think the problem is that we don't teach that well what to look at. And you don't get taught to counsel a patient for his expectations. You know, if there's, it's like buying a car. The cheapest car brings you from A to B, but it doesn't drive as nice as an expensive one. And I think that is what you also need to explain to your patients and always keep in mind, there's no perfect vision. And we only work with physics. And you can tell that any patient, I can't make you 20 years old. You know, I'm only a doctor. I can treat your disease and I can use the laws of physics to help you with that. And halo is just a secondary image of the diaphragmatic structure. And if you start explaining it to patients in a way that they understand, then they do much easier living with it. But first, you as a doctor have to understand it, that all those companies that are telling you how great the lenses are, they also only have the laws of physics. There is no magic behind it. And when you understand the physics behind it, then you can explain it to a patient in easy words, and then you will have happy patients. Yes. On that note, the last question is actually, do you allow neuroadaptation or decide to decide on lens exchange early if patients are unhappy? To being honest, I haven't explanted a trifocal lens or any presbyopia correcting lens in the last seven years of my own patients. And I did quite many, even in studies with newer optics and um, it's a way of counseling the patient. It's a way of dealing with the problems. 
a trifocal patient unsatisfied with near often the target refraction is not right. Do a touch-up laser or implant a sulcoflex to correct the spherical error. Correct the dry eye, then usually they're happier. Often the pupil size plays, plays a role, you know, give them remodidine eye drops to make the pupil smaller. They used it for LASIK patients for a long time when the optical zones were small. Or even you can give them pilocarpine in a smaller dosage of 0.1% and from one day to the other they're happier. So, you know, see it as a disease, as if you would treat the patient as a normal ophthalmologist when they come in with problems and then you find a solution and you don't need to explain it. But sure, if somebody would say, I'm really unhappy, and the problems that they describe me, I can say they're related to the physical properties of the optic, I will exchange the lens without a question. But so far, most of them have other issues, not an issue with the little bit of halo that they see. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's a combination of understanding the science as well as setting a proper chair time to decide on that right eye well. On that note, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Kretz, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, hi all, I'm Dr. Omar Magdi. I'm from Egypt. I'm a member of the Gersu Young Ophthalmology Committee. I would like to welcome you all to our first Gersu Young Ophthalmology Research Corner Session. Today, we are going to discuss an editorial published in 2017 titled Standards for reporting refractive outcomes of an intraocular lens based refractive surgery. I would like to introduce to you Dr. Alistair Stewart. He's a graduate of the University of Nottingham Medical School, Comple uh, completed his cornea fellowship at Moorfields Eye Hospital, completed a refractive surgery fellowship at London Vision Clinic under Professor Dr. Dan Reinstein, now a full time consultant of refractive and cataract surgery. Also, I would like to welcome two of our rising stars in ophthalmology, Dr. Anisu Medikan from South Africa. She is, uh, she, uh, she is recently certified as Secretary of Ophthalmology Society of South Africa, Young Ophthalmologist. And I also would like to welcome Anata Bogov from Bulgaria. He's a fourth year ophthalmology resident in Bulgaria, founder of the Ophthalmology Resident Bulgaria Society. And I will leave you with Dr. Alistair, if you may. Hi, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon to join you all. So this is a paper that I actually wasn't on the authors, but I'm a part of the team that, that drew up this paper. We, we try to be quite prolific with our research. So we have an ethos for trying to get as good a data as possible. And I think this paper really falls into that category. And I thought the best way to start this was to allow you guys to, having read the paper, ask some questions. I have got a talk, some slides to go through. I'll share my screen in just a moment. But I think if you guys start by asking your questions and working through there, and then we can go to the slides at the end. Okay, sure, it sounds great. Um, so, um, first of all, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, I read the paper uh, before actually I was asked to uh, be on this panel. Uh, and it's a great paper. And um, my first question that I wanted to address is, uh, uh, you know, all of this requires a lot of hard work. Uh, you must have been a very big team with very dedicated. Uh, so what was the main idea? What was the challenge or the problem that you are trying to solve when you're tackling this uh, scientific problem? So our take on this was that there was a paucity of good data out there particularly for reporting of IOL-based papers, that the outcome measures that were being measured didn't really carry much weight. And so it was based on the fact that in 2009, Professor Einstein, who's, who's my colleague and boss, wrote, wrote a paper, an editorial with George Waring, highlighting this problem that the data wasn't good enough. And then it was referencing back to George Waring's standardized graphs that he created for refractive surgery back in 2000. And the idea was to, to draw up similar graphs that would be applicable to IOL surgeries. Because when you go through the paper, you'll see that some of the graphs that are used for standard outcome measures for refractive surgery pa patients, just laser-based procedures, they aren't applicable. They get a little bit lost in the cataract world particularly. So it was a way of adapting those to make them applicable for IOL-based procedures, particularly cataract. All right, great. Thanks, uh, Dr. Stewart. Um, 
in the editorial, you suggest doing away with the use of post-operative corrected distance visual acuity. I'm sorry, pre-operative corrected distance yeah. visual acuity. And you use yeah. only post-operative uncorrected and corrected distance visual acuity as, a, as an outcome to measure exactly. refra uh, refraction. Can you just shed a bit of light on the rationale for, for doing this? Sure. So when you have refractive surgery patients who are having laser refractive procedures, their corrected distance visual acuity pre-op is not affected by anything other than their refraction. So when you've got cataract patients, that, di that is different because they've got reduced best corrected vision because of their cataract. So if you're comparing pre-op corrected distance visual acuity to post-op, it rather gets lost in that. So for that reason, we were just using post-op distance corrected visual acuity with unaided and therefore that gives you an idea of how close to the target you got i.e how close to unaided vision you got how close your unaided vision was to their best corrected vision does that make sense makes a lot of sense thank you um i'd like to ask when you spoke about uh, achieved versus attempted spherical equivalent refraction in your article uh, hmm. you mentioned something very interesting to me in particular so uh, you said that uh, this graph was actually compromised when analyzing outcomes for cataract surgery. Could you elaborate more on that? It's essentially exactly the same again. In the, 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 in the presence of cataract, the pre-op manifest refraction is unreliable. So if you've got someone with extremely dense cataract, it's very difficult to get a manifest refraction from that patient that's going to be accurate. So it just compromises your data. So we excluded that from the new graph space for IOL. All right. Okay. Um, and then uh, moving on towards um, assessment of cylinder specifically when we're looking at mm. refractive mm. errors, the article or the editorial speaks quite a lot on um, on the topic of cylinder and astigmatism. Yeah. Could you just yeah shed a bit of light on that as well? <laughs> well, it's a very long discussion. The fact is that it's it's extremely complicated because when you're doing refractive laser procedures, you're only influencing the corneal astigmatism. Of course, when you're doing IOL, it's whole eye that comes into it because you're removing a lens. So essentially, it can get really, really complicated. There are ways of doing it, but because it's such complicated maths, we kind of took the stance that it, it didn't need to be the standard. So we just included um, a graph to sort of give the idea of how close the refractive outcome were, which is the fourth graph, the refractive cylinder, to say what percentage were in a quarter, what percentage were in half a doctor. We didn't think it was necessary for it to be gold standard to go into full vector analysis of corneal changes versus lens changes because it does get very complicated. It's admirable if people do that and it's useful, but I think to give a standard across the board, it was taking it too far. Uh, sorry, Alistair. Can you give us a short, short note about the, the paper because the audience didn't read it before? So this is the paper here. Um, it's titled Standards for Reporting Refractive Outcomes for Intraocular Lens-Based Procedures. And it came, like we say, in response to this editorial in 2009, highlighting the fact that there was a paucity of data for lens-based procedures, that there were some big gaps missing in how people reported data. The, these were some of the problems that the accuracy of the refractive outcome is, is sometimes only shown as a cumulative percentage. For example, the number of eyes within a spherical equivalent outcome within plus or minus 0.5. But some of the authors were including mean visions with standard deviations. But this method can hide, can, can hide outliers if you do that. So if you're just applying a mean, you're, you're going to hide the, the ones where you did particularly badly, but also the ones where you did particularly well. And that some authors were also reporting the mean corrected distance visual acuity before and after treatment, which, like we've already said, is inappropriate because the change in corrected vis distance visual is, is hidden in the worst cases. So when, when the results should in indicate, whilst results should in indicate the percentage of over and under corrections as set out in the standard graphs for reporting refractive surgery, that way when you do it like that, you know if there's a trend towards over or under correction, whereas if you're just putting a mean out, you don't see that. Although a mean can be of some use, it has to be supplemented by the efficacy bar chart. 
which is the cumulative percentage of eyes with uncorrected distance visual acuity at each snell and line of vision. So essentially what we were trying to do with this paper is, is to standardise the way that we report outcomes for IOL papers so that we can draw better conclusions. Because if you're not comparing apples with apples across papers, it becomes very hard to do that. So this is the, the standard graphs that was produced by George Waring for, for laser refractive procedures in 2000, and it was based on this. We then adapted it to go through all this. Uh, so uh, my question basically continues uh, from Anesu's last question. Um, I want to touch briefly on uh, surgically induced astigmatism. Mm. So it was very interesting to me that uh, the refractive uh, cylinder uh, post-op is actually influenced by both the IOL as well as the corneal incision so, or surgically induced astigmatism. Yeah. And uh, I love how your paper actually uh, um, implied that these, uh, uh, both of them should be analyzed separately. Correct, yeah. Do you think it's a good idea for uh, future journals like the GRS and JCRS to encourage this separate analysis of those data? Yeah, I think plenty of people do. I, I think it's just a matter of, uh, to, to understand how those things work separately. What we were basically saying in the paper is if you don't, if you just lump it all in one, the data becomes very, very murky. So by separate, separating them, you can do it, or you can just basically, like we've said in the, in the paper, just sit back and just use uh, the manifest refraction at the end. That's the simplest way of, of, of getting that data across, but you can really drill down into it. But we felt that if you, those, those vector analysis and things, to ask for those as a gold standard was going too far. Okay. And still on the topic of astigmatism and um, cylindrical refraction, what would you suggest would be a good way of accurately reporting on um, refractive outcomes in the setting of a patient who has a cataract but also has significant astigmatism? So you want to give this patient a toric IOL. Um, mm. How would we report on those kind of patients in view of the fact that the pre-op um, manifest refraction is unreliable? That, exactly. This is the this is the whole point. So this is why it becomes very difficult. So essentially, what you're aiming for is to give the patients the best manifest refraction they can have at the end. So that's what we recommend using, and then suggesting what percentage of people, how close they were to planar. Okay. So what percentage of patients have a spherical equivalent within 0.5? What percentage have within plus plus or minus one diopter? And that gives you an overall idea of how close you are getting to it. So you can drill down into the corneal, you can drill down into the IOL cylinder, but it does get quite messy. Okay. Um, the last thing that I would like to know from you, Dr. Stewart, is in clinical practice, how can we use these, these graphs and these reporting methods to optimize the way we treat our patients? So taking it from research and into our clinics and into our operating theaters. Well, essentially, it's it's the, the, a matter of thinking about it and and auditing your own data. Uh, until yeah. I joined the clinic, when I think back of the way that I analysed my 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 cataract outcomes, it was pretty limited. Um, you essentially need to do a good number of eyes, collecting really good data, and then work back, and then you can start actually thinking about well, what's my individual surgically induced astigmatism. You can think about it for different IOLs. You can standardise it for each one. And you can just get closer and closer spread of your outcomes by doing that. Great, thank you. Very good point. Uh, my last question to you uh, is again linked with uh, the practical applications of this paper. So do you routinely in your practice uh, measure the posterior corneal astigmatism? Yes, we do. But when I'm doing my, my cataract surgery patients, well, I, I will, will look at that. I tend to just use the IOL master in general for in indications as to whether I'm using a toric. And then if, you, if you're re relating then to whether the patient has had refractive surgery previously, I will use the Barrett formula, so the Barrett True K. So that will just import the data from the anterior surface of the cornea from the OL master and make your calculations off that. And I found that to be very accurate. So this is the, the, the four graphs that we have produced for recommendations for, for IOL-based surgeries. So A and B are the same as in laser surgery, but as we were suggesting earlier, they only compare the post-op unaided vision 
with the post-op corrected distance visual acuity instead of using pre-op best corrected. And C is the post-op surgical equivalent in comparison to the target refraction. And D is the way of displaying the total refractive cylinder post-op. So if you're using these four, then you you're really are going a long way to, 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 to showing good data in a standardized way. And if we can all be doing this, then it just makes it much easier to compare all our outcomes to each other worldwide for whatever IOL we're using. Uh, yes, we have uh, some questions here. Uh, a question is saying, what is the optimal way of measuring total corneal astigmatism? Well, there are, there, there, are, there are several ways of doing it. There are plenty of plenty of eyewell masters and um, optical biometers that are out there. I, I don't really think that IU personally use the eyewell master 700 at present. I think they're all extremely good that are out there mm -hmm. at the moment. I don't think there's any particular lead. Mm -hmm. um, also, I have another question. Do we ignore ventricular astigmatism when doing then surgery, assuming it, it will disappear with the surgery? Correct, yeah. That's correct. Uh, I have a question. I've read the, um, the paper, and there is a title for every uh, curve, like the stability, predictability, safety, and efficacy. What does it mean, each one of them? For the basic, it's very basic, I know, but so as the audience can learn. So, are you referring to the nine graphs to begin with, or for the four yes. for IOL? For the graphs, yes. For the nine or for the four? Sorry, because things like like safety was was excluded for the for the IOL ones because of the change in cat in corrected distance visual acuity that you see with a cataract population. So that really clouds that. So if I go through the the nine from from that we used mm. for laser procedures, you've got the first two which are efficacy, i.e., how good the result was. So you're comparing your unaided visual acuities to best corrected. Safety mm -hmm. is what percentage of patients lost no lines, what percentage of patients lost one line, two lines or more than two. You then have your attempted versus achieved, which is looking at whether you, what, the, what is the trend for how close to correction you got and whether you're getting a over or under correction. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have predictability. So this is another way of comparing the post-op spherical equivalent to the target refraction. Mm -hmm. Stability is self-explanatory. It's how, how stable the patient's refraction is at the time. Again, this was re re removed for IOL procedures because in reality, there are going to be few reasons for refractive instability after cataract surgery. It's not like the regression that we see with, with laser-based procedures. And then the cylinder that we've discussed already with refractive cylinder and better analysis. Mm, okay. That's the whole nine, but we then condense <laughs> that to have A and B for looking at the post-op unaided visual acuity with the post-op corrected. C was the spherical equivalent to the intended target, and then D, a way of displaying the refractive data, the cylinder. Okay. So a lot of it is condensed because a lot of it wasn't applicable. It's mm -hmm. not as in as in depth as it is for the laser-based procedures. Uh, I have a question from Dr. Florian. Uh, sure. Is there a standard for report of defocusing outcomes? Not within this, no. And I, I, I'm not aware of a standardized way of doing that. There are lots of ways of, of measuring defocus curves. It's something that would be really great if we could do, particularly with now with everyone moving sort of towards depth of focus con with spherical collaboration control. That would be really, really useful, but it's not included at present. Uh, Okay, I think that will conclude our session now. Uh, I would like to thank you all for attending this session, and I would like to thank our presenters and our young ophthalmologists. We'll move on now to You're the welcome. next session with Dr. Michael, who will be presenting about how to write an effective cover letter, how to re uh, respond to reviewer comments, and how to avoid predatory journals and you guys really want to stick around for this. I'm Lena Beckers from Germany, a member of the Young Ophthalmologists Committee of Gerozo and I'm honored to moderate this session today. I'm especially happy to announce my colleague and good friend Dr. Michael Mimoni who will present three talks today to teach us fundamental points on research to help you doing your first steps writing a cover letter, respond on reviewer comments and 
avoid predatory journals. So believe me, he knows what he's talking about with more than 150 papers published. He has a lot of experience and we are really happy he shares his tips and tricks with us today. So Michael, I think the stage is yours. Well, what a great session so far. And thank you so much, Lena, for the kind and generous introduction. Um, my name is Michael Mamouni, and I'm a second year cornea fellow at the University of Toronto. And I'm proud to be a part of the Gerso Young Ophthalmologist Council. Today, I'll be covering with you how to write a cover letter, how to respond to reviewer comments, and how to avoid predatory journals. And I'd like to start by focusing on how to write a cover letter. Uh, these are my financials, none are relevant to this talk. In order to explain the importance of the cover letter and what it should look like, you first need to understand how the manuscript submission process works. After all of the hard work you put in and your manuscript is finally submitted, it's screened by the editorial office to make sure that it meets the technical requirements of the journal. Afterwards, it's sent to an editorial board member who takes a look at the paper and decides whether it's sufficiently interesting or not and merits moving on to a full peer review. Now, they're going to take a quick, quick look at your paper, starting with your cover letter and abstract, and then decide based on that whether or not your paper is interesting enough for them to skim through the rest of it. If the editor decides to reject your paper without even inviting reviewers, I call that a hyperacute rejection. Now, with good journals, this usually happens within days, and they try not to waste your time. This also happens to anyone who is regularly involved in research, and you can't always avoid it. Still, there are things you can do to improve your chances of avoiding it. So how does one avoid a hyperacute rejection? Well, you want to make a good first impression. Now, while your research paper's role is to prove the merits of your research, a strong introductory cover letter is your opportunity to highlight the significance of your research and sell it to the journal editors. Here's an example of a poorly written cover letter. It doesn't name the editor-in-chief, it only contains the title of the paper, the journal to which it's being submitted, and a request to review it with incomplete contact information of the corresponding author. I'd like to provide a few tips on how to structure your cover letter the right way. Start by making sure that you write the cover letter with your institution's letterhead to demonstrate professionalism and reliability, as demonstrated on the bottom left. In addition, personalize the cover letter by addressing the journal's editor by their name. Take note that often doctors in North America prefer to be called doctor, whereas in many countries in Europe and other continents, they prefer to be referred to as professor. Taking a quick peek at the editorial board information on the website will help you determine what they prefer. You also want to make sure to provide the title of the manuscript you're submitting at the beginning of your letter so that they know what it's about. This professional start shows that you did your homework and is a sign of respect towards the journal and its editors. In the second paragraph, you want to provide a brief background for your study and the research question you sought to answer. Ideally, keep it brief with no more than one or two sentences of background information for your study. Then, emphasize what information is lacking in the literature. And last but not least, provide the purpose of the study. In the third paragraph, you want to provide a brief overview of the methodology and provide the editor with the principal findings of your study. Make sure to mention the type of study, namely whether it's prospective or retrospective, and make sure to include the patient population, such as keratoconus patients in the example provided below. Describe the one or two most important findings of your study. You want to get the editor looking at those findings and make them say to themselves, hmm, that's interesting. Immediately after listing your main findings, you ideally want to follow that up with one of the two following statements. You want to either be able to claim to be the first to discover a new finding, or you want to be able to say that this is the largest study to assess that question. If you can make one of these two statements, you're more likely to garner interest from the editors. But before you make either of those statements, make sure to write to the best of our knowledge, you want to show some humility. Nobody likes a show off. And make sure that these statements are actually true and don't make them if they're not. That will only upset the editor and or reviewers. So perform a thorough literature review before submitting the cover letter. The last paragraph of the cover letter should be dedicated to the mandatory statements that the journal requires. Most journals ask for a statement that the manuscript has not been previously published 
and that it's not under consideration by another journal. In addition, most ask for a statement that all authors have approved of the manuscript and agreed to submit the manuscript to the journal. You end the cover letter with contact information of the corresponding author. Ideally, if someone from the study group is an authority on the subject, it may be wise to allow them to be the corresponding author. If the editor is familiar with their name and knows that they specialize in that field, they are likely to show more interest in the paper. Another important point is to provide institutional contact information. Your email at the university or hospital would be more appropriate than a personal Yahoo or Hotmail account, which may include your significant other's name on it as well. Just to be clear, that's not a real email, but a perfect example of what you want to avoid. Let's quickly review things you should avoid doing at all costs. First, you want to avoid using jargon and acronyms wherever possible. The editor may not be very familiar with the language, especially if your study deals with a certain niche. Don't make the editor work hard trying to understand what each abbreviation means and don't make them feel like an idiot. Second, you want to avoid embellishing your findings. Describing your study as the best study ever or stating that it will revolutionize your field is more likely than not to annoy them. Third, don't provide too much information. Your cover letter should not be more than one page. Fourth, make sure that your cover letter addresses the correct editor and correct journal name. It's very embarrassing to submit a paper to, let's say, the American Journal of Ophthalmology, but for your cover letter to be accidentally addressed to another journal or to the wrong editor. Last but not least, your cover letter should not have any spelling mistakes or grammar mistakes. That just makes you look lazy. It makes the editor think, well, if they have mistakes in their cover letter, what mistakes do they have in their research paper and their manuscript? Hopefully, the tips pro provided in the talk, all based on a real cover letter that I've used in the past, will give your cover letter that slight edge and help you avoid hyperacute rejection the next time you submit your paper to a journal. Now for the next session, I'd like to talk about dealing with comments from your viewers and the proper way to respond to their comments, criticism, and questions. So you submitted a paper to a journal and you patiently waited a few weeks or months to hear back from them. Finally, the day arrives and a decision has been made. The journal writes back that they find your paper interesting, but that there are several concerns and comments that the reviewers and editorial board have raised. They'd like you to address them for the paper to be reconsidered, and they kindly point out that this does not guarantee ultimate acceptance for publication. And when you first see this response, especially at the beginning of your career, it can be a bit stressful. You may feel from the comments made that they didn't like your paper. Some of the comments may even make you feel like you're under attack, and your gut response will be to take it personally. There'll be comments that you'll look at and say, how do I even deal with that comment? I've got zero chance of getting this paper accepted. Now and then there are comments or questions which are even difficult to understand. Some of them may seem so wrong that you feel like saying that reviewer doesn't even know what they're talking about. And in this short session, I'd like to give a few secret tricks to dealing with those comments. The most important piece of advice I'll give you today is to revise your manuscript as quickly as possible and respond fast. First and foremost, the journal provides you with a deadline. If you miss that deadline, then you'll need to resubmit the paper as a completely new manuscript and start from the beginning. If you have an excellent excuse justifying a delay in the revision, such as a worldwide pandemic, then you can politely ask for an extension, but you wanna avoid that at all costs. Why? If you take too much time to respond, then the original reviewers whose comments you address may no longer be available or interested in the paper, and the editor may be forced to invite new reviewers. This will lead to further delay in the processing of your manuscript, and you are at risk of having a completely new set of comments, questions, and criticisms to deal with. You not only want the same reviewers, but you want them to see the revised version while their memory is still fresh. Otherwise, you're forcing them to work harder and to go over your manuscript in detail again. And that's a great way of annoying them and forcing them to look for more mistakes. Similar to the cover letter we discussed earlier, start by making sure that you write your response with your institution's letterhead to demonstrate professionalism. Personalize the response by addressing the journal's editor by their name and make sure to provide the title of the manuscript you are submitting a revision for. Often reviewers and editors will spend a few hours on your manuscript and their intent was to help you improve your paper. So you want to begin the actual response with a small thank you to the reviewers and editors 
for taking the time to review your paper. It's a quick and cost-effective way of starting on the right foot. You want to make sure to address each and every comment or concern in a point-by-point -point fashion. Now, a few pointers about the point-by-point -point response. Provide a separate section and numbering for each reviewer. Sometimes the editor will also provide comments, in which case you want to give him or her their own section as well. For every comment that needs to be addressed, start by providing the original comment of the reviewer. Then provide your response for that comment and provide the reviewer with the exact location of the changes made. If you want to make life even easier for the reviewers, you can even quote the actual changes that you made in the manuscript. They'll appreciate not having to go back to the manuscript to verify the changes. When it comes to each individual response, you want to be polite and thankful. As odd as it may sound, you want to throw in a small sentence of gratitude before actually providing your response. Even if you don't agree with the comment and plan on pointing out why, you can still thank them for their comment. If the comment raises a concern that helps you improve your paper, you can let them know that you appreciate the important point that they have raised. Sometimes the reviewer will even identify a mistake or you'll find yourself completely agreeing with them. In those cases, letting them know that you agree with them is a great way to start the response. However, you wanna make sure not to repeat the same thank you over and over again. It looks really weird if for each response you write, we thank the reviewer for their comment. So be sure to mix it up. In addition, if the reviewer has pointed out a small technical issue like a spelling mistake or a redundant word, there's no need to begin your response with a thank you. Simply point out that it's been corrected in the revised manuscript. Now, what do you do when the reviewer requests that you add information to your study even though that information was already there? Simply put, the reviewer overlooked or missed the fact that you had already provided that information in the paper. Now, the simple option would be to kindly point out to the reviewer that this was addressed in the original manuscript, and I used to do that in the past. However, I think a great way of addressing these types of situations is to simply slightly rephrase that section so that it's clearer to the reviewer the second time around, and point out to them that their concern is now addressed in the revised manuscript. I find this method better because you avoid telling the reviewer that they were wrong, and you still point out to them where that information is provided in the manuscript. Also, remember that if something wasn't 100% clear to the reviewer or they overlooked it, the readers might overlook it as well. So rephrasing that section may have an added benefit. Sometimes the reviewer may ask you for some information that you simply cannot add to the paper or comment since you no longer have any control over it. It may be a comment about data that is simply unavailable, such as, it's unfortunate that the authors did not perform an anterior segment OCT in all their patients. Uh, it can be a comment about the sample size being small or the lack of a control group. Sometimes the fact that it's a retrospective study can rub them the wrong way. In these situations, the simple solution is to say, you're right, we completely agree with the reviewer. And a little trick of mine is to always add that as a limitation to the study using some of the reviewer's own words and to let them know that as well. First, it makes sense scientifically to admit the limitations of your study. Second, it's a sign of respect to the reviewer that their comment actually led to a change in your manuscript. One last point for this section is that I really find that it helps to have extra pairs of eyes going over your response letter and revised manuscript. Others may see a mistake that you simply overlooked. Remember, you're human and it's okay to make mistakes. In addition, your colleagues may understand your reviewer comment that you didn't, or they can understand it differently. It also helps to have an experienced colleague or mentor walk you through your first revision. They can help you save a lot of time and increase your chances of getting the paper accepted. A few words of advice. Don't send the revision to all of your colleagues at the same time. Send to them one by one and ask them to use the word track changes feature. This will save you loads of work later on and prevent multiple versions of your response letter from floating around. Give them an internal deadline such as, please, prov please provide your comments within 48 hours. Remember, we said earlier, a fast response is a good response. Start with your junior colleagues first and then run the last and more mature version by your senior colleagues and mentor. Hopefully the tips provided in that section will help you respond to reviewers in the future. In this final section, I like to talk about open access predators, which I refer to as the dark side of publishing. 
After working hard on your research, your goal is to get it out there and to share your research with the scientific community. The problem is that the peer review process is an uphill battle. In fact, we recently showed that less than 50% of studies presented at the American Academy of Ophthalmology meetings are ever published. And even when you do finally get it published, it's simply inaccessible to most readers that don't have an institutional library with access to subscription journals. The reason being is that the business model of subscription journals is based on providing the abstract for free, but charging for access to the full text manuscript. In fact, for years, that was the only model available. So that is where the open access model came in. The idea behind this model is that the paper undergoes the same exact peer review process. If the paper is accepted, the authors pay the journal to have the paper readily available to all readers for free. This increases the accessibility for the scientific community to the paper and its findings and increases the exposure of the authors and their hard work. The overall goal of the entire model was to improve research worldwide and to remove constraints. This model was so successful that in the past 20 years, it's, it's evolved from a couple of dozen journals to thousands of journals now adopting this model. Furthermore, almost every journal today, even the subscription-based models, have an option allowing authors to choose whether or not they want their paper to be open access. Now, naturally, wherever money is involved, you'll find that there are those who are trying to take advantage of the situation in order to make an easy dime. Unfortunately, this has led to the development of open access predators. These are illegitimate journals for publishers that prey on scientists like you and I. Simple ways to differentiate between a legitimate and illegitimate open access journal are the following. The illegitimate ones send spam emails trying to convince you to submit your paper to their journals. They charge huge sums of money for them to publish your paper, and there's no real peer review process involved. The predators almost never have an impact factor, and they are usually not even listed or indexed on PubMed. How does it usually work? Well, these open access predators have automated crawlers and computer software that collect emails of corresponding authors from papers published on PubMed. They then create automated emails inviting you to publish your research with them. Please note several points. Often these emails land in your spam box. That's a huge red flag. In addition, they'll call you doctor or professor instead of calling you by your name, another sign that these are predators. Often they'll use journal names that sound legitimate or similar to an existing journal you're familiar with. Using a similar name to trick you is in fact a sort of phishing scam and a common tactic used by predators. So pay close attention to the exact name of the journal. Here's another example of another spam email from an open access predator. First of all, here they were so lazy that A, they didn't even get my name right, and B, they accidentally identified me as a dermatologist. Again, look at the phishing scam. They present themselves as the American Research Journal of Dermatology, which is strikingly similar to the American Journal of Dermatology without the word research. A classic phishing scam, so always pay attention to every detail. These predators not only try to invite you to submit papers, they also invite you to be part of their editorial boards. Appealing to your ego is a very dirty trick they play. You may find yourself flattered from the offer, not realizing that it's illegitimate. These predators stop at nothing to try to make money. They'll offer you to speak at conferences, and if you dig deeper, you'll discover that it's a conference not recognized by any society or professional group. They'll offer you to write a review paper or to write a book chapter. They often do so offering a special discount, anything to get you to pay up. Now these predators have gone completely out of control. In fact, this is a snapshot of my spam box. Other than Xenia, who says hello and would really like to know me better, my entire spam box is infested with these predators. Now, just in case you get an email inviting you to submit a paper and you aren't sure if they're a predator or not, simply run the name of the publisher on Google. This is an example of a publisher called Peertex. And when I search them on Google, you can already see a couple of websites warning me against them. The problem is that the number of predatory journals and publishers is literally skyrocketing. There are today thousands, if not tens of thousands, of these predatory journals and publishers trying to scam us. And a few years ago, a librarian by the name of Jeffrey Beale started to dedicate his free time towards increasing awareness to open access predators. In fact, he coined the term open access predators and predatory open access publishing. He even built a blacklist of predator publishers and journals and built a website where scientists could report new ones. 
And I personally used that website for years, every time I had a doubt whether a journal was legit or not. And a couple of years ago, I noticed that his website was no longer available and had been taken down. Apparently, he had been sued by a controversial publisher for over $1 billion in damages, simply for accusing them of being an open access predator. As a result, and in order to avoid the lawsuit, he took down that website. I was honestly worried that Beale's website was in a way our last line of defense against these predators and wrote a letter to the editor to the American Journal of Medicine addressing that very concern. In fact, we showed that 90% of the predators in our spam box were listed on Beale's website before it was taken down. With that being said, how can you protect yourself these days from falling for an open access predator? Well, start by making sure that they have an impact factor provided by the Journal of Citation Reports, or at the very least, make sure that they're indexed on PubMed. There are those that rely on the directory of open access journals, which is supposed to be a repository of legitimate open access journals. However, a clever group from Poland created a fake online profile and CV for a Dr. Ozusk, I hope I'm, pro I'm uh, pronouncing that right, which literally means Dr. Fraud in Polish. They then applied for the position of editor for hundreds of journals to see which journals would accept this fake doctor as an editor without even checking for credentials. They showed that 33% of the predatory journals were happy to accept Dr. Fraud as their editor-in-chief, while none of the legitimate journals that had an impact factor were interested in hiring Dr. Fraud. Unfortunately, 7% of the journals listed on the Directory of Open Access whitelist hired Dr. Fraud, indicating the vulnerability of that whitelist. I'll conclude this section of the talk by saying, if you wonder why I take interest in this subject, it's simply because I personally fell for these predators in the past. Here's an invitation to be an editorial board member back in 2014. Unfortunately, I let my ego get to me and reply that I was interested. Apparently, I was not the only one. It took numerous emails and requests to take my name off their website before they finally agreed. And my final message to you is that if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Thank you very much for your time and to my colleagues for arranging this wonderful session. Uh, I guess that's back to you, Lena. Thank you, Michael. Great talks with amazing tips to help us all with the publication progress of our research work. So the audience had some questions I would like to forward to you now. Sure. So first one, would you advise if it's okay to answer without answering all the reviewers' remarks, just to be fast and maintain the momentum? That is an excellent question. Um, I'd say that if you can pull it off without being caught, great. If you can, I, let's say if you don't answer 50% of their questions, you know that they're gonna realize it, they'll catch on to you and they won't appreciate it. But if there are 30 comments and you have and you avoid one of the smaller ones which you have difficulty with, it may it may go unseen and unnoticed. So if you think you can get away with it, great, but be careful. I, I rarely employ that tactic. And the next question is, do you take the impact factor into consideration when sending a paper to a journal? How do you choose which journal to send your research work to? Uh, another great question. So first of all, I'd like to start by saying that the official impact factor is provided by the journal citation reports. Unfortunately, there are a few websites out there that provide a fake impact factor, that they kind of calculate their impact factor by themselves, and that doesn't really count for anything. So you want the official impact factor as provided by the journal citation reports. Next, I do definitely prefer aiming for a higher impact factor journal, but you wanna make sure that it's a journal that you actually have chances of getting accepted to. So if your paper isn't really top notch, then you know maybe it's best not wasting your time with the higher ranked journals. And you wanna make sure that your paper is appropriate for that journal. So let's say if I have a paper on refractive surgery, I'm not gonna submit it to retina or to ocular surface. Uh, so you wanna make sure you submit your journal, your paper to the appropriate journal. Okay, thank you. So again, we would like to ask our guest residents if they do have any questions or experience they want to share about their research and publication experiences. Hi, Atanas. Hi. 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 Hello. This was a really yeah. great talk. I just want to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. So informative. I appreciate more than anything else the little tips and tricks like bowing down to the editors. Very important. 
<laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I would like to know is um, when you have um, produced a work of research that you think is worth um, editing and usually as a resident you do it in conjunction with um, your head of department or professor, wherever it is that you're specializing. How do you uh, do your authorship? Is is there a correct way to list the names? Um, the, for example, Madikani et al. How 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 is there is there an order in which that should be done? Oh, excellent question. Are you referring to how do you decide on authorship on the paper itself? Exactly. Or the exactly. You ask? So that's a very yes. sensitive question, and it's highly dependent on the region where you live. But I would say that in general, the um, head author or the senior author uh, who thought of the study, who accompanied you throughout the study, is usually the last author, whereas the young, vibrant author that did you know, a lot of the grunt work and a lot of the groundwork and wrote the paper is usually the first one. Uh, it's not always that way. The most important thing is actually to uh, have good communication with your colleagues and to be very clear on authorship at the beginning of the project uh, to, you know, to avoid any inconveniences later on. Also remember that you always have the option of sharing for equal contribution, uh, both for the first author and the last author. I've seen papers even have situations where they have three authors listed as co-authors for the uh, with equal contribution for the for the first spot. But I think that's a bit, you know, pushing it. Uh, I think it should be limited to two at most. And Michael, we do have another question. Sorry to interrupt. Another question from the audience. Um, it's how about ethic committee approval? Is it mandatory for all journals? That is an excellent question. I'd say that the journals are much more picky when it comes to a prospective study as opposed to a retrospective study. All journals definitely demand that you have an REB. Um, they also usually request that you mention in the paper that you have an REB. And if it's a prospective study, they ask that you write that um, you had informed consent, signed and documented informed consent. Last but not least, if it's a prospective study, uh, interventional, make sure to register it with clinical trials or one of those registers first. Uh, most most you know, journals that respect themselves today require that as well. Uh, that's to avoid what's called a publication bias or a positive results bias. Yeah. I have a question that might be a little bit basic, but I think our audience also includes um, some junior residents. So could you explain to us what is this impact factor that you've been talking about? All right, so um, impact factor, um, it's calculated by the Journal of, Cit of Citation Reports, which is Thomson Reuters, if I'm not mistaken, that's actually a company behind it. It's basically based on two variables. One, how many citations you have, and two, how many papers were published for that journal. And it goes back two years. And that's why it's updated each year. So the more citations you have to your papers, the higher that journal's impact factor is going to be. And on the other hand, the more papers they have, that's actually going to lower them. And you'll notice that often the journals with the highest impact factor are those that actually publish less papers per quarter. And the ones that have the highest, highest impact factor usually have a lot of meta-analyses and um, systematic reviews because those tend to get many more references. So for sure, mm -hmm. the editor, when looking at a paper, thinks to himself, hmm, is this paper going to be cited or not? And if not, they may be reluctant to accept it, even if it's scientifically sound. OK. OK, so maybe at and the end, one last question from Atanas. Oh, sure. So um, uh, I loved your presentation. And I'd like to say um, we're living in a very interesting time period right now. Uh, where we're communicating online mostly. So there's this um, uh, um, online platform called ResearchGate uh, that is very famous for uh, researchers. So um, do you use uh, that platform to connect with other researchers to do projects together? I definitely use ResearchGate and I make sure that whenever legal, I upload my full text manuscript there. You have to be very careful. There are certain journals that don't allow you to share on these platforms and certain journals that do. So whenever I can, I definitely share my paper there to get it out there. Uh, I don't know if that increases the likelihood of you know, receiving uh, more uh, citations to your paper, but I'm sure that it increases accessibility because it shows up in, in the search engines and on Google when people are looking for the full text. And not everybody has access to you know, institutional libraries. 
And um, yeah, we have come to the end of our session. Um, thank you all for listening and the vivid discussion. And a special thanks to you, Michael, for the great talks, really great, informative, clear. Um, now I will hand over to the impressive Emane to Rip again, who will moderate the next session with the amazing Tanya Twin. So enjoy everyone. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lena. Great job. And thank you, Michael, for pouring all that knowledge at us and doing three talks instead of one, because why not? You're so awesome. And thank you again. It is now my absolute pleasure to move on to our last session of this outstanding webinar that I am really enjoying very much so far with our secretary, Dr. Tanya Trin. So Dr. Tanya is a Australian qualified ophthalmologist. She is a cornea external disease and refractive surgery fellow from the University of Toronto. And she is actually currently doing a second research fellowship as well in cornea and refractive surgery in the same university. She will be talking to us about how to secure your dream fellowship. Tanya? So um, welcome everybody. My name is Tanya Trin. I am the secretary of Gozo, and it's honestly such a pleasure to present to an audience of some 70, 80 people. This is a really great turnout for our first uh, YO session, which we will be holding on a monthly basis. And we've had the pleasure of hearing from some phenomenal speakers today. Um, and we're really excited to round out this session on something um, that some of you may choose or may be considering or planning for um, in your career trajectory. And it's really about how to secure the fellowship of your dreams. And I will apologize in advance. There, are, This presentation will be littered um, with uh, pictorial debris from my own fellowship experience. But really the point is to inspire you to think about doing a fellowship because really that's that unique space between finishing your residency and becoming a fully fledged and busy attending um, is, a, is, is a time that you should really think about using wisely for yourself. Okay, so why do a fellowship? We do a fellowship because we're looking at gaining some international expertise to complement what we've learned in our home base. We're looking for the opportunity to subspecialize in a particular niche of, of, ophthalmology, of ophthalmology, looking perhaps to experience different health systems. A chance to travel is actually a, a really big one out there as well. The opportunity to make connections both in the research world and the clinical sciences, um, pursue research opportunities and discovering your own growth outside your comfort zone as an attending, developing to a specialist and consultant. And it's a really unique time because you don't have exams anymore and you have less on call or different on call. You're not the first cab off the rank anymore. And you're really learning just for the love of learning. And you're learning in a new and exciting department. And you have both more and less responsibility in some ways. It's not as stressful as being an attending and it's not as annoying as being a resident at the same time. And you have time to do a little bit more of those extended projects outside of your immediate realm. You've got extra papers and presentations that you've put off, educational initiatives, and it might sound like it's a walk in the park, but it's really not. And I should make that very clear. It is still a very big commitment and chunk of a, you know, anywhere between one to three years out of your time. You must be prepared to work hard. If they say jump, you say how high. And it's not uncommon for people to say when you do your fellowship, they sort of own you. And it, there's some truth to that as well. But really, it's about investing that time and effort, which will pay dividends over your career. So where do you begin? The world is your oyster. I would just get out there. And don't limit yourself to where your bosses have tread before, although you know that these are tried and true. Remember that your local area also benefits from having some diversity of the background of where you have trained. The second thing you should know is that you need to begin early and know the application cycles because they differ from institution to institution and often also from country to country. You can start off by mapping out the network, look at your bosses, look them up online, where did they go for their fellowship? What are they like as a clinician in your eyes these days? Or look up prior fellows of X institution that you might be wanting to look at and track and see what they're doing in the ophthalmology space today. You can read around your area of interest and looking at the authors around that topic area, 
track them back to their institutions and have a look at the websites and what they're doing. Application cycles you need to be aware of. In Australia, it's usually the year before, but you're best applying and putting your hat in the ring a little bit earlier. The biggest centres such as Sydney and Melbourne have six monthly entry, like January and July, and I just might make a note here that academic cycles can be different depending on the hemisphere that you're in. In the USA, you are subject to the SF match for many of the qualified fellowships. And in Canada, people begin applying one, even two years prior. And certainly the fellowship that I'm currently uh, a part of is, is probably booked up a couple of years in advance. In terms of the UK, generally people will apply about 12 months prior. And the reason for this in many of these cases, if you're going internationally, is because the visa process takes so long to, to commit to and be complete by the time you get there pandemic notwithstanding. Now, it's not within the scope of this talk to cover what the different fellowships are around the world. There are honestly thousands, but do let us know in your feedback if you'd like a fellowship features session. So what did I look for in a fellowship? Honestly, Dr. Alan Side from Paris probably said it best. I was once told, don't choose a job, choose a boss, because the mentor is probably the most important thing that you'll get out of this. It's not unreasonable also to think about hitching your wagon to a rising star. So in my fellowship, we have the foundations laid by the prolific and phenomenal Professor David Rudman. And from him under his, his department, along with Professor Alan Slomovic, are two rising stars, Dr. Joshua Teichman and Dr. Clara Chan. And then we've got our early careers to superstars, such as Dr. Michael Mamouni, who you've just heard of. And it helps if there's a sponsor in the mix and you should know the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And a sponsor is someone who actively thinks of you and puts you forward for an opportunity, whether that be a book chapter or a panel position or a paper. And they should be as hungry as you are, only they have a lot more experience than you. And that's really the hierarchy of, of a really good structure of a fellowship that you might wanna look at. The other things you should consider is opportunities to do research, presenting and networking opportunities. But remember ultimately that this someone or this group of someone's is someone with whom you are choosing to form a close working relationship for life. So what else do you look for in a fellowship? Look at good surgical volume, a range of procedures. There are benefits of being at an academic center versus being at a more peripheral center. Often the surgical load and the clinical experience is actually quite varied at a peripheral center because they're not have got the luxury of, sub, of referring to other subspecialties close by. Look at what the other fellows of that institution are doing right now. We all have access to social media and it's really important to keep tabs on what's going on and what, which areas seem to allow people to really flourish and develop into their own. And look at the qualities and characteristics of the individuals that you wish to be inspired by or emulate. Things to be aware of. So language requirements. I have had colleagues that have done, you know, fellowships in Italy and places like that. But language requirements can make it very difficult if you're not a native speaker, at least at medical level, um, to really appreciate the nuances of your subspecialty. You need to know, can you operate there with your qualifications? Not all countries will, uh, will have qualifications that are translatable into other contexts. Is there equivalency between certain countries? Is there equivalency in the amount of experience that you may have had as a resident? Visas come into play, and particularly in the US, we have visas, some of which will allow you to operate, some of which will allow you only to do research, and it is difficult in some of the private centers or where, where medicine is privatized, where if you're not able to be licensed and make money, they're going to find it very difficult to actually fund your fellowship. In some areas, the fellow actually generates the income that is used to pay them. Preferential treatment you should also be aware of is their competition with local residents that may impact on your surgical or clinical exposure. And now the number of other fellows is also a factor. And you should be aware also that some, some fellowships are not paid at all or are very minimally paid. 
and you should also know that in advance that you, this is something that you need to put away money for in order to be a little bit more comfortable when you achieve your fellowship years. You should think about the job opportunities when you come back. You know, is there an absolute surplus in the area of subspecialty? You may wish to rethink that. You think of areas of need would be the flip side of that comment. And also think about, you know, if you have a family going on, what are they going to need? Is there access to schooling there? What supports is your partner going to need when they're moving to this country? And what are preceptors looking for? So really, they are looking for someone they can get along with and they can trust, who's responsible and motivated, who wants to learn and be productive. And they are looking for someone who communicates well in a team and is polite who's prepared to pay it forward. Someone who anticipates well, and I call it the red carpet treatment, which harks back to my phrase, if I say jump, you say how high, or if I say, if you say jump, I say how high, is really someone who's constantly thinking about what is my boss thinking? What do they need next? What can I do to make this clinic consult role or this surgical case go forward because you're going to be the one being that proactive initiative taking person because eventually this is going to become your problem to solve. Preceptors are looking for people with good surgical hands and solid clinical acumen and it also makes it quite attractive if you know that you're going back to serve an area of need. Many fellowships are designed precisely with the intention of enriching an individual and sending them back to their own country so that their local area can benefit from that expertise. You're also looking for people who are prepared to get really stuck into some research and presenting and representing their actual institution. And if you've got that knack about you, we're looking for innovators as well and people who can really think outside the box, whether it be in research or education or surgical techniques. How do you get your foot in the door? So traditionally, we would use websites. Email is always a good one, although sometimes I get quite a lot of comments from residents saying, look, I've emailed so many times and no one's responding. But you can reach out, you know, via other means. Social media is becoming an increasingly acceptable way, but you need to make sure and be respectful that that social media account is a professional account. Many people will have personal and professional accounts and you should stick your conversation to, to professional accounts only. A couple of other things that I thought about, which I have not personally employed, but probably would be great opportunities, is if you're signing onto a list serve of a subspecialty and you're noticing that someone is doing a lot of work in an area that you're interested in, or if you're at a conference and they have the 7.30 to 8 a.m. sessions with breakfast with the experts, and that is a great opportunity to get one-on-one -on -one time. Wet labs that are hosted at conferences will often pair you a resident or a, or a learning ophthalmologist with someone who is an expert in that field. And so that is one on one time. Now, I did not use this opportunity, but just to demonstrate, this is a wet lab um, at the Canadian Ophthalmological Society where I randomly happened to run into Dr. Susan Jacobs, who I think the world of, um, and managed to spend one on one time with her as a resident learning how to DMEC. And we had a great conversation and really got to bond during that time. The company stores will often have speakers presenting at a certain time and they often linger around for talking opportunities afterwards. And after the sessions in between paper and panel sessions are also a great time to catch someone. If you can't catch the boss or the head of the department, chase their former and current fellows, particularly if you're still scoping out and trying to decide what you want to do. And for these reasons, when you're in the physical presence, a paper copy of your CV is always handy, particularly if you're anticipating on meeting them in person. Now, a lot of people who come from very far away, and I'm probably more referring to people who come from places very far away like myself, Australia, will often do a fellowship tour. And what this means is contacting several institutions and saying, hey, I will be flying in from Australia in order to visit your institution. I will be available during the weeks of this and this. Is it possible at all to make your acquaintance during this time and visit the department? And most people, and particularly in the UK, they are quite accommodating. They understand that you're actually taking time and cost out of your schedule to come and see them, and you are making it a serious commitment to see what the institution is like before you put your hat in the ring. 
And so that always speaks volumes as well. Present, present, present. So obviously it's the best learning in itself anyway, because you get to investigate this topic in depth, but panels connect people and sponsors connect people. So you may be seated alongside one of your bosses who puts your name forward and introduces you to the other panel members. And that's a great way to form a bond as well. So a health checkup for your CV. So resident see life is so busy and I am 100% guilty of this, but put everything into your online calendar and then perform a CV health checkup if you're so busy, ideally every month, but just look back, if you dump it all into your online calendar, look back over it and put it into your CV. And probably about every three to four months, particularly at residency level, Fix the holes. So I've put up the CanMeds criteria here, not particularly because um, I'm kind of decentric, but it's just a good overview of areas in which you might be able to target or structure your CV and make sure that you are becoming a well-rounded individual. Actively target your weaknesses. So if research or volunteer experience or leadership experience is not something um, that is particularly predominant on your CV, you may wish to think about that and be proud of your face. Now, these uh, there is lots of conflicting thoughts about whether you do or don't put your, you know, your image on your CV. Um, I personally would argue that you should because people are visual in terms of learning for the large part. And if every connection that you make to draw that visual to your CV helps. So your CV structure, now this is just a, a suggested example of CV structure um, that could use, you're more than welcome to screenshot this. And it basically breaks up um, the achievements that you've accumulated over your time into very clear categories. So if a person goes, I wanna know whether they've got X experience because I would really value that in my department, they can go straight to that section. Um, the, there is a very variety of other ways that you can do this. I've just put up some screenshots. I terribly apologize in advance, Dr. Mamuni, for putting this first screenshot of yours up. But you and I've blocked out any um, private details. But you can see that there are many different ways to structure it. Some people decide to put in a personal statement um, just to let them know a little bit about themselves. Some people choose to leave that out and get straight into the meat of things, and they're perfectly acceptable. Observerships. These are invaluable for the observer and preceptor because it's an opportunity to see what the city is like, whether you like the weather, whether the department is one that you'd like to be a part of. And it's a chance for them to get to know you because a big part of your fellowship is finding out what your personality fit is. It can also be a learning experience in yourself. Not everyone has the luxury of committing to a year or a couple of years long of fellowships. So observerships are just as vital as a part of your learning. And often you should see if you, there's an opportunity, if you're there long enough, to try and get some research fit into the realm as well. Do you have to do an observership? No, but it does show that you are serious. It does give you a bit of an advantage. And some fellowships will personally not take someone that they haven't met um, because they're not sure whether they go through all the rigmarole of appointing a position and that's, that person doesn't come and take that position up. So how to make a good impression on your observership. Be punctual, know the entrance, the transport options, have backup options, make sure you've got Uber working in the currency and the credit card of that country. Um, don't upset the administration, the techs or nurses and be politely proactive in the clinic and the OR and have a chance to show your anticipation. It's really important not to be a wallflower. You need to be memorable because you may be applying for this one or two years in advance and be prepared to make conversation about yourself, about the task at hand, about the issue that you're looking at. A couple of things that I have noticed about some observers is really be aware of personal space and certainly there are cultural differences with this and personal hygiene, so having your shirt ironed, that you've had a shower in the morning, that body odor is not an issue um, and take an active interest at the task at hand. Ask questions, read up and most of all, don't constantly be on your phone because it can come across as being incredibly disrespectful. Your fellowship interview, so be prepared to shine, smile. What is your demeanor going to be like? And now that we are well and truly into the COVID era, there is no excuse for not having good lighting, 
and absence of sound disruptions, being appropriately dressed for the occasion, also being punctual and setting, checking your settings well before the interview time. You should have researched the department, know what their projects are, know who your interviewers are and what their research interests lie. Know what your research inside out because they may invite you to talk about one of your project areas. And you should know your surgical numbers, your surgical rates, as well as your complication rates. And this is an actual question that is not uncommonly asked in an interview. You should practice with a friend or record yourself on Zoom so you know that any ticks that you have, your pace of speaking, elocution, addiction, any resting facial expressions, that was particularly helpful for me as some people found me a little bit scary when I was presenting in the past. Have a really clear idea of what your goals and plans are beyond the fellowship and know what are your unique features and what you have to offer the department. Practice, practice, practice. So practice your questions. There are so many resources out there for questions that you may be asked during a fellowship interview. I, when I do fellowship interview questions with my residents and train them, I encourage them to type out their responses to the point where you would actually be proud of delivering that answer live. And the point is, is that you are laying down neural pathways for the phrases and that familiar, familiarity will beget confidence. It is so much easier to think of your examples and stories of, tell me of a situation where you might have X, Y, Z, and they're fresh in your mind and often very adaptable. And it's really important that you're not painting yourself as the hero in each position. You need to have some humility and insight. And the more that you do this, the phrases will roll off your tongue and it takes so much stress out of the situation. You can actually begin enjoying the interview process and getting to know your, pre your potential preceptors a bit closer. I'd probably recommend spending about three to five hours preparing your answers and rehearsing. Common and trickier questions. These are just some of actual questions that have been asked for both of myself um, and of other people that have undertaken fellowship interviews. So tell me about yourself. Why do you want to come here shows an, an opportunity for you to say, you know, I know what the department does. I'm really interested in this area and working with this person. What you will bring to the department. Now, what are your surgical complication rates? It was actually a question that took me off by surprise. Um, so you should know what the average resident's surgical complication rates should be. Even better if you have something local in your, um, in your data and that you know yours as a comparison. And then you've got the trickier questions where they're, where they're trying to elicit a little bit of judgment and how you might be operating in a team. So tell me about a time you spotted an upcoming problem or when you accidentally caused a conflict and how you resolved that. They're also looking at have you applied anywhere else and that's always a tricky question. You don't want to make it like you're just you know, dipping your toe in everywhere possible and you do want to show a level of commitment. So that question needs to be approached carefully. And the question that often people may ask is, are you aware that there is very limited or no funding available for this position because they don't want to be giving the position away and have that person be blindsided by that. They are actually quite open about this and you should have plans about how you're going to support yourself. So your surgical logbook, for all residents, you 100% should be cataloging this from day one. Many training programs will often you know, have a requirement that you keep one anyway. And if you don't, an Excel sheet is perfectly fine. But it allows you to identify and strategically target areas that you have limited exposure and target those. And you should be videoing all of your cases because in some fellowships, you will require this for your application. So I would take 30 minutes daily after an OR day to categorize and you need, because not only do you need original footage for your talks, but having a system to label these by pathology or surgical technique or by your boss, and this is just a screenshot of, of my own organization or system, um, is a way for you to track so that you know that, yep, you know, if, you know, for example, Dr. Ike Ahmed's fellowship requires you to submit a surgical video so he can look at your hand. So you need to have a way of rapidly going and fetching a video, editing it, making sure that, you know, you're trying to show your best, Obviously, a highly edited video is going to play against you because it looks like you've got something to hide. Um, but you should be not only doing this as a learning exercise, um, but for educational um, initiatives further on in your fellowship as well. And so that's a real uh, learning point that you might have to offer. Now, if you're low on surgical numbers, you need to think about 
the year in which you're going to apply your fellowship because you will need to factor in your time to build your surgical numbers up. There are places around the world where the ophthalmology residency doesn't include any cataract time or any operating time at all. So many fellows will have worked as an intending for a few years um, to build up clinical and surgical experience before they would really be eligible for some of the fellowships around the world. It's important that you're aware of surgical training opportunities if your local program doesn't offer it. And there are places, um, particularly in the UK, that offer a &E fellowships or cataract fellowships that are specifically designed where you offer your time and expertise in terms of the clinical load um, and they offer you the opportunity to teach and learn about um, surgical procedures. Talk to your course directors and see if they can support you in attaining some of these numbers as well. And don't discount a research year if you're wanting to build relationships and also bump up your, your research papers as well. So what is universal currency? It's a mentor who personally take time out of their schedule to vouch for you. So it means a lot more if I say, look, I personally know Dr. Lena Beckers. She is an excellent resident. I am so proud of her research achievements. I will pick up the phone and call someone at wherever they are at a convenient time of them around the world to put in a good word for her and say, look, I highly recommend you should take Dr. Beckers. She would be an excellent candidate and I think your institute would really benefit from having her and we would like to have her back, which leads to my second point. Having a job to go back to speaks volumes of any applicant because it means that that institution is prepared to invest that time to let that resident go away and also that they're the type of person that they would have back working in their institution. Research papers are forever, so you will never lose time by investing in research. We've spoken about surgical cases, numbers and videos as well. And any innovations that you've had time to develop along the way um, also is a real um, a feather in your cap too. So just very quickly, I realize we're running late on time. So after the interview, follow up within a week. If you hadn't heard back, email is probably the most polite and less intrusive and be consistent, particularly if you're having to apply one or two years in advance. It's not, you know, um, unheard of for people to say, look, I just let, wanted to let you know that thank you for the opportunity. I am still interested if the position is available or even if the position becomes available earlier than anticipated, and if you're able to, to fit that role, then I would highly recommend that you put that into your email as well. Finally, be the person that you needed when you were looking for a fellowship. Should spread the word about um, your fellowship if you've had a positive experience, share what experiences you've had, make sure that you're involved in teaching and education along the way, put in a good word for others. So if you know you've got a resident at your own institution who's looking for the same sorts of opportunities as you were, you know, make sure that you become part of that network of building other people up as everyone benefits then. Nominate individuals if you think they would make a great fit um, and make sure that you're contributing to your, your unique fellowships community because they really should be like family, just family that you have around the world. So other talks related to this one, just some topics like if you want to hear about making the most out of your fellowship or specific tips related to your residency and how to amplify the quality and quantity of your surgical exposure. And we've also mentioned we're thinking about doing some fellowship spotlights. If anyone is interested in that, let us know if you're interested in hearing about these. And the final words of advice is I'm a big believer that you create your own luck and your own opportunities. Do not let where you come from or your level or your language or anything like that hold you back. There are some amazing examples. You know, we have had fellows who literally, um, you know, Dr. Randall Elijah probably won't um, mind me sharing this story, but he came and he asked for the fellowship three or four years in a row before he got in. And he has now grown and flourished in the area of Costa Rica. And it's probably one of the surgeons that has done the most Yamani procedures in the world. And it came from very humble beginnings. So people like that, I find incredibly inspiring and great examples of what you can do if you are just consistent and persistent. You really don't have anything to lose and I would highly advise you put your hat in the ring. So questions? Thank you so much, Tanya. What an inspirational, wonderful talk. 
uh, I guess a lot of the attendants are really keen on knowing about this subject and you just gave some outstanding pearls. Thank you so much. So I'll just move on to the questions. We'll probably be here for an extra five to 10 minutes because there are so many questions. And meanwhile, can I please ask Dr. Atanas and Anes to, uh, to turn their cameras on because we'd like their feedback again. So the first question, Dr. Tanya, is how do you decide how long to do a fellowship, whether it's a six months, a year, or longer than that? If it's up to sure. you, of course. That is a great question. So you will often find that fellowships that are pre-existing um, have non-negotiable times already. So certainly the fellowships in Canada, for example, or the US or Australia tend to be one year or two years and they will tell you up front on their website and it's non-negotiable. Um, we do have some fellowships and perhaps my UK colleagues um, can elaborate on this that advertise for six months with the potential to extend, but certainly every Australian that I have ever um, seen go to the UK, we really commit for a minimum of a year. And there are many reasons for this. It is really hard to do anything meaningful with, you know, in terms of it takes a while for your boss to get used to your surgical hands. It takes a while for you to get used to this operating room and the instruments that they use and the settings that they use on the cataract machine that in order to really flourish, you do need to plant your roots just that little bit more and develop that relationship of trust so that you are able to do a lot more of the complicated things because you're not trying to replicate your experience in residency, uh, although there will be a part of that in the beginning where you're just trying to you know, get used to things. Um, but the but the other thing is that if you're going to do a research fellowship, that is a little bit different. And that probably will depend on the background of that institution and how well set up they are to get you off the ground and running. So I know that um, Dr. Mamouni has worked with um, the Alio Institution in Spain and even within the space of four weeks was able to um, generate a lot in terms of research um, initiatives during that short space of time. I know that you personally yourself had an amazing time with Dr. Pretz in six months and was highly productive. So research does lend itself, um, but you need to make sure that you're going with someone who's passionate about the topic and is a prolific researcher themselves as well and has the opportunity set up to allow you to accomplish that within a very abbreviated sense of time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so before I go to another audience question, Dr. Athanas, did you have any question for Dr. Sanya? Oh, sure. So first of all, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I think many of the audience here was um, very uh, eager to get an answer to these questions uh, that you uh, mentioned in your talk. Uh, so my question is regarding the interview process of the fellowship. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, there's a lot of competition, uh, a lot of people are applying for this very uh, highly competitive spot and how do you present yourself in a good way uh, without sounding like it's, uh, like it's kind of bragging? <laughs> There's a definite art, I think it's a great question Artanas, and there's a definite art to doing that. Um, I think the best way to frame that is you want to put your best foot forward, but you need to be able to frame your misgivings as a learning opportunity. And you don't want to present yourself as a person who has absolutely no holes because insight is, and there are a lot of narcissists in ophthalmology, um, and you, you don't want to come across that way, right? Um, so I think just you know having a, a warmth about you that you can communicate your facial expressions, but also showing that you really care about your patients. You know, if you had an adverse event, if you're asked to talk about an adverse event that you had, you should be able to analyze what it was, what your role was when that occurred and how you took responsibility for that and how you learned from that opportunity and turn that into, you know, an opportunity for growth. Um, and that just shows, you know, that the worst candidates are probably the ones that said, oh, look, I really can't think of any time that I was anything less than perfect. You know, it's actually quite an irritating candidate to have. Um, I think that it is okay also to be proud of what you've achieved and it's okay to phrase it like that, you know. Um, you know, it's okay to say, look, I, in Dr. Tarib's case, you know, I spent six months working under the direction of Dr. Florian Kretz and I produced three papers, which I'm really proud of. And you should be proud of that. And there is nothing wrong with saying that. 
um, you know, it, it, it's something that um, I think, you know, you've clearly invested a lot of time and you understand the value that the value and the learning opportunity that you've received. And you can always tie the end of that conversation with I learned so much under his direction. Um, and it's really enabled me to do X, Y, and Z following on. So there's always ways to frame answers. And that's why I said it's really important to rehearse them beforehand and have the examples there because then you're not trying to organically think of the opportunity or the story and then also try and phrase it correctly at the same time. So it and people always worry like does it mean like I sound really rehearsed at that time? It's not. It will actually become a lot more organic um, because you're focused. They're never going to ask you the same question. So your response is always going to be a unique response to whatever scenario that they give you. So it is definitely a fine line bet between coming off as arrogant and actually being proud of what, of what you did. And that's a, a very good point that you raised. Oftentimes, most of us find ourselves very confused to what to actually say and what to keep to ourselves and let the interviewers actually just learn from the CVs. But uh, excellent point. Thank you, Dr. Tran. I know that you just graduated Dr. Anesu from residency and probably a fellowship is not such a bad idea at this point. Yes, Did you have yes. any comments or questions? Dr. This was so informative, informative to the point and all encompassing so much so that I, I literally have nothing to ask. I was screen grabbing almost every second slide because it was so pertinent. What I would like to ask, though, is something a bit personal. Could you share with us a highlight um, from your fellowship? What is one thing that stands out for you? Oof. So many things. Um, I have, honestly, I have loved my fellowship time. I could not have thought of a better place to have, you know, I come from quite a small place in Australia. It's not an academic centre. And when I chose uh, my fellowship, I chose it based on the fact that not many people had gone to Canada in my local area. So I wanted to bring something different back. Uh, he had an excellent reputation, not only in terms of surgical innovation, but also in terms of research exposure too, because they're quite, you know, an established university and they've got support mechanisms for that. Um, I, the real highlight is probably working with the, the staff and my co-fellows has been an absolutely phenomenal experience. And it's not just the co-fellows that were in my immediate time, but it's the connections that you develop you know, I mentioned Dr. Ulate before, who's actually a former fellow of ours, um, and probably one of the most special trips that I had um, was going down to Costa Rica to learn how to do Iamani and being able to work with that sort of population and also learn from someone who clearly taken the amazing opportunity that they had been given and taken it back and then has really invested back into the betterment of healthcare in their local facility. Um, so seeing that in action was, as well as Costa Rica being amazing, <laughs> you should all go, um, is, is just really inspiring. And I think some, you know, the it's really about the spirit and the community and the family that we have here in our fellowship and that every, no one leaves feeling like they were not 100% included. You feel like you can reach out to these people during any point in this career. Um, and it's really, these people really want to see you flourish and develop. And so they will actively think, you know, Dr. Chen was like, look, I have a book chapter with Susan Jacobs. Would you like to do this? I'm like, sure, go for it or Professor Rootman has a basics and complex DMEC course and how to do so we can go teach others. He gets his fellows up there. Um, and Professor Alan Slomovic has his cornea surgical video nights where we actually get up and we pit our complications in front of super scary people and get feedback. And those are really unique opportunities that I would never have had access to at home. So I probably couldn't pinpoint one aspect of the fellowship, but I 100% would and that's why I included those tips in, you know, what are you looking for in a, in a fellowship? You really want something that an area that is going to allow you to grow and allow you to stand on their shoulders so that you can get someone hitched on yours when it comes to, you know, your time around. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Tanya. Thank you. There is definitely a professional as well as a personal aspect to every yeah. uh, fellowship, especially when spent in a different place uh, from where you, you have lived always.
Gerza Young Ophthalmologist, thank you. A huge thanks to everyone who attended today, especially our special guests, Dr. Alice Stewart and Dr. Florian Kretz, um, headed by Ankur Barua um, of the UK, who is our amazing and phenomenal chair, and supported by a, basically a Young Guns team. I'm very, very proud um, of the meeting that they produced today. So just to remind everyone, Gerza Y.O. is an ophthalmologist in training, I think to about 10 years out from the conclusion of their their uh, residency or fellowship. And really, we are looking for people like you to get involved. Um, the organization is innovative, highly interactive and relevant, and we hopefully high yield for you today. And our next session is on cornea. Our second session is on the 21st of November. We are running along the themes of cataract, glaucoma, refractive, and um, whatever one I left out. We are looking to expand eventually to other areas of ophthalmology once the organization expands as well. So if you are a resident that's not really sure about what they want to do yet, um, then I would highly recommend um, that, that you keep an eye out for these opportunities to get involved. Um, we are looking at doing sessions in the areas of research, education, industry, and the session that I just presented, which is what I wish I learned in residency. So make sure you register at gerzo.org. You can follow us on the various different social media platforms. We are always excited to hear from you. And write to us at thegerzo.yo at gmail.com if you would like to put your hat in the ring. We have so many projects coming through the pipeline and we could really do with some help. And we love the fact that we have representation uh, and would love the fact to have a little bit more representation of areas around the world. Um, so thank you very much.